podcast time, baby. Featuring the frustrated recruiter. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Mike Tech Studios podcast. This is Michael Midnight, and today our topic is actually going to be candidates in staffing. We want to get into company culture and really just fundamentals of what's important for recruiting. With us today, actually, is going to be our first guest on the podcast, TJ Vagadia, a recruiter with uh, quite a few years of experience under her belt. Uh, you can find her website and interesting uh, blog post at the frustrated recruiter.com. TJ, TJL, how you doing? I am doing good. How are you? I'm doing awesome. I'm glad you, you, you made it with us. I know that you were feeling a little under the weather earlier when we were talking. Glad you were able to brave the elements and join us today. So tell us, uh, what, what is it about recruiting really that made you want to get in the field in the first place? So it was about helping people, uh, not only just helping people, but I'm also a big fan of being able to eat. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> a lot of other jobs that you know, social worker or non-for-profit, um, you, you're kind of stuck in the salary that you get. And recruiting helped me see that I could pay off my student debt. I could have a decent living. I've, while my primary goal has always been to help people find the jobs that they're looking for, I love matchmaking. The secondary goal is always to make enough money so I can feed myself. Absolutely. Now, for social work and volunteer work, that just never interests you at all for those types of professions. I I know that, you know, they can be really intense, like recruiting as well. And, and, you know, it is matchmaking in a sense, but there's really nothing about those fields that interest you at all. So I do volunteer. A few weeks ago in January, my company took us to Mexico to build houses for people who didn't have houses. So I do like volunteering and I do like giving back to the community. It just never, I never wanted to do that as a career. Social workers and people who work in not-for-profit have a lot more patience than I do. I really admire what they do and I could never do what they are doing. Well, I think the biggest difference with that is with recruiting, even though you can ignore your phone calls and emails. Mm -hmm. Social work, you kind of take that baggage with you. So I I had, uh, I've had a couple of friends who actually did do uh, that type of work and work for the city um, when I was in New York City at the time. Mm-hmm. And it's very wearing, you know, where you, you hear these child abuse cases or these welfare cases and they stay with you. you know, if you have a candidate that kind of creeps you out or really impressed you, yeah. that's, it's like, hey, that's cool. Okay, I'll see you later. And you check out. You really can't check out when you have a a kid that's starving you know it's just, yeah it doesn't it doesn't work the same way so i can definitely understand that with recruiting as a whole what really do you find like the biggest challenges that the companies that either come to you or that you work with that, that they ask of you as a recruiter when you are seeking out the talent for their needs so i think recruiting has evolved in the last few years where managers at least most of the managers i work with now understand that we're not gonna when they ask for a senior level net developer we're not gonna give them five qualified that they're going to fall in love with in 24 hours. We are in technology and people who are good already have a job or they don't want to hear about it or people that they want are already have a job. So they understand the fact that there's a reason why they're paying us the fee that they're paying us, whatever percentage that fee is, because we are needed for our services. We go out and find those people, but it's a process. So it's challenging trying to find the right candidate for the right client. At the end of the day, even though I do think of myself as the person who's helping the guy or the gal find the right job, I get paid by the employer, right? So my job is to find the right match for them. And then if the candidate that I have is not the exact match, I'm not going to say, hey, bye, have a good life, work with somebody else. I'm going to keep still talk to them and see if I can help them further. You know, you really do sound like a professional matchmaker there. It's like, no, don't worry. This one didn't work out for you. I'll, I'll keep you in mind in case, a, you know, a pretty girl or guy comes your way. And, you know, it, professionally, yeah. it would be, you know, the girl or guy would be like the next, you know, different job, you know, administrative or IT or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, it's truly it is truly matchmaking because we have to find out what makes a client tick and then we have to find out what makes a candidate tick and there's a saying at least in our office there's a pot for every lid you just have to find the right pot for the lid 
Agreed. Agreed 100%. Well, you know what? It's also communication. Any mm-hmm. good relationship, personal, professional, spiritual, going to the store and talking to the cashier, it all involves around real solid communication. Nothing is really more paramount than when we're talking about money, work, love. You know, it's it's all going to be about communication. So that's, that's definitely critical. Yeah. I mean, without communication, you might as well be a robot, right? So... Well, if you've seen a lot of these emails that do come out uh, from recruiters... <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put it past them at this point. I mean, the AI is getting really, really good. So yeah, there's, you know, there's people always like, oh, the AI, the robots are going to take your job. I'm like, yeah, no, part of it, not all of it. Recruiting is still a human business, right? So you still need the human element because an AI, while they can figure out what makes you tick, it's the personality that matters. It's what makes you, not only what makes you tick, but how you talk to people that all also matter. So many things that can go wrong up until you get the day you start as an employee with one of my clients that kind of risk mitigators try to lower the risk as much as possible for both sides of parties. Sure, sure, absolutely. No, and, and, and that makes sense. And you make a good point about the personal aspect of recruiting. And I really do feel that, I don't want to say exploited, but it's it's not really explored uh, as best as it could be with a variety of recruiters. What What's really your best medium like when when you want to get to know a potential candidates or you really want them to what you're reaching out for them for is authentic or genuine what, what's the best method that you employ what, what what's your favorite medium so I um, depending on the position if it's a contracting role I'll go for dice or one of the job boards people who have actually posted out their resumes and even for um, contracting roles I'll go on LinkedIn one of the biggest things that I do is a uh, about the salary. This is a range that they're offering depending on your skill set. Because when you give somebody a range, and this is my personal experience, when I give someone a range, they automatically only hear the high number. They don't hear the low number. It's a little bit funny. I'm like, this is what they're looking to pay. Now, what you, what are you looking to make? You know, I'll be honest. I'm like, dude, this is not the right position for you. Continue talking. I want to get to know more about you. So when the right position does come about, I can give you a call and say, hey, here's the position you were looking for. I've got this, this, and this from that. Let's talk. That I think is really key. So just clarity of those types of details and communication. You know, with clarity and especially with salary, I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to a recruiter and they really held that that point at gunpoint to you. It's, they immediately jump to you. How much are you looking to make? Or what's your present salary so that you have that dance of, you know, What's the position? You know, what's the contract offering? Well, what are you looking for? Well, what is it offering? Well, what are you looking for? And it just avoids that standoff where if you can just say, hey, listen, company A, this is what they're looking for. This is the salary range. You know, talk to me. What do you think? It's all about being honest and upfront about with the people that you're working with. Because if you're not going to tell them what's going on, what? why should they tell you anything about themselves? Right. What's the point? Yeah, it's, it's a two-way street. And most recruiters forget that it's a two-way street. They think that they hold all the power and the candidates don't hold any of the power. Truthfully, have I asked somebody their salary? Yeah, I have. But I've also been able to tell them and coach them as far as, hey, you're not making enough. Here's what you should be making. And a lot of times people will, even when I ask them what kind of salary you're looking for, they'll be like, this is what I'm currently at and this is what I'm, I don't know what the market is. And I'll guide them because not only is my job to find the right candidate for the right client. If I don't have that candidate for the client, I'm not making any money. Right. Right. So my job is to not only be the finder or the sorcerer, as I like to call myself, (laughs) um, my job is also to coach the candidate on what's right and what's wrong. Sometimes I see wanting 75K and I'm like, yeah, no, that's you're going to make that in about two years. You're not going to make that right now. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're in Seattle or something. So. Well, even then, I mean, I think, you know, realistic goals and expectations, you know, it's one thing to have in your mind what it is, where you see yourself, and also where with a recruiting or agency's help, where you can end up. And I think that misinterpretation or even miscommunication of expectations, it can cause a little flack. What's the biggest misinterpretation of what people think being a recruiter is about or, or recruiting 
in general to your understanding? Most people don't understand the amount of work that it goes into helping somebody find the right job or helping somebody find the right candidate. Everyone thinks that we just send out mass emails and we're just resume pushers because I'll get messages and say, oh, go ahead. I'll send a LinkedIn message and they'll be like, yeah, go ahead and send my resume over. Here's my resume. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not just going to send your resume over. This is my butt on the line. Let's talk. Let me make sure you are actually the right fit for the client because you might have the skill set, but you might not have the personality. People think we just push resumes back and forth, push job descriptions back and forth. There's so much more to that. For every job that I get, I talk to anywhere from 50 to 100 people and I present what between one and three. And, and that makes sense. I mean, I will play devil's advocate and say that the majority of recruiters that I have been in, not 100%, but the majority, like probably uh, high 80s. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they have, they do just push out, you know, spray and pray. And, Absolutely. And it's just, you know, it, it is disappointing because I, I haven't had a lot of great experiences with recruiters. Very, very few of the few that I did have, whether I got the job or not, I was impressed by the way that that recruiter held themselves, you know, during the conversation, or I actually wanted to know them outside of work. You know, this would be, and especially in, in my area of work, you go out and grab a beer with people or, you know, grab coffee. Mm -hmm or something like that constantly. And yeah. if this is somebody who I could do that with, I would definitely, I want them as part of my team. And that's essentially what I feel a recruiter could be given the right circumstances and, and again, the right fit. Yeah, it's like dating, right? Not every date you go to is your life partner. Not every recruiter you talk to is going to be your life partner. And I totally hear you when you say spray and pray. I have been in an environment, big name companies do that. They are all about KPIs. They're all about metrics. Make 100 calls a day submit five candidates for this purple squirrel job. My last job, I once looked at my manager who has been in staffing for 25 years and he asked me for five senior level Ruby on Rails developer, but I just lost it. I'm like, yes, let me go to the submittal tree and get you five submittals. That's not happening. So I t definitely hear what you're saying as far as spray and pray, but it's all about, unfortunately for those recruiters, it's about the KPIs and making sure they hit their numbers. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, when you do that, you know, you're just yep. looking at straight numbers. That's just like a business in it just for profit. If you're hurting people, then you're not in the right place because at some point it's going to fail and then you're going to, I mean, I've had that, I've had actually recent experiences that have made me question recruiting as a whole. And that's really why essentially this has come at the right time and place for the people who I have come into contact with after the fact, even for designers, you know, mm -hmm. I've been a designer myself for probably doing work for over a decade now, personally and professionally, you know, it's a race to the bottom. You'll have so many people who want to debate on value. Well, this person said they'll do it for, you know, $15 an hour. And I'm like, you know what? Go with that person because if we're if we're going to sit here and talk about price rather than value, you're not the customer I want to talk to because that's really where your mindset's going to be. And that's ultimately, although important, yes, not the only category you should be considering when bringing somebody in. As it goes, you get what you pay for. Exactly. <laughs> so. No, I completely agree with you. I get that all the time. When you hear that, it's like, oh, the person's going to do it at $10 an hour or whatever. You're like, yeah, that person's sitting in India or China or Ukraine in a factory and there's no, they're just pushing things out to push things out. In the same way that you have those KPIs that you're doing the same thing, just at a lower price point. We've talked about a lot of your skills, some of your headaches and highlights. What's really one thing that you personally bring to the recruiting front to try to make a difference in, in staffing in the recruiting community for candidates versus other recruiters or other agencies that are available? So in this day and age, every, everyone has the same tools, if you will, to get the same candidate. What I bring to the table is my personality, my attitude, my drive to learn what I'm trying to fill because I truly believe that if I cannot speak even the basic lingo of the position I'm trying to fill, there is no point in me trying to have that conversation. And that's why I started my podcast to help other recruiters. The fact that I come from a technology background, I used to be in help desk and live and breathe technology. Technology excites me. I think the drive of wanting to speak their lingo is what makes me different. It definitely sounds like it. And that's why I reached out to you in the first place. Just seeing the passion behind your work, your posts, I mean, troublemaker at the frustratedrecruiter.com is, is yeah. definitely a memorable email. Not only can you provide that assistance that so many people need, but 
there's a little bit of a flair to it. Doing the type of work that I do, how I come into, into contact with people that I do, I mean, I can definitely understand and respect that. Comes story time now, I would be curious to know what would be one, I guess you could say, horror story and maybe one awesome story that you've had in the field that could be working with a company, it could be a candidate. A horror story. This is one story I love telling people about, but I have two horror stories from my uh, recruiting time. And this was like my first year in recruiting in Arizona. I had just started recruiting technical people. The first people, it was like within the first month, technical recruiting. And I called this person. And at that time, when you were staffing for contractors, you take the liability. But this person got an aggravated assault charge in attempted murder charge on there because they went to some other country, found this girl, started dating them, got married, tried to have kids with her. They went to the doctor. The doctor said, no, you are fine. You should be easily able to have kids. So they go back to their wife and they're like, you know, I went to the doctor. I'm trying to get you pregnant. You're not getting pregnant. The wife goes, no, no, hang on. Um, I forgot to tell you something. Then the wife discloses that she used to be a man at one point. Oh, man. And while I oh boy. sympathize and empathize with the guy's s- scenario, they got the charge on their account. And this is what I was telling you about. People tell us things we should not know. That's my horror story. I'm like, I didn't know what to do with myself. I'm like, <laughs> That's I'm- a toughie. I'm not going to, I'm not going to disagree with that. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was was like, uh, okay, and I got out, and I get out, and I empathize with the dude, but I'm thinking, what did I get myself into? That's when you start stepping into the social work aspect of things, and yeah, I mean, unfortunately, when you're, you know, when when you're in the recruiting realm, it's it's a little bit of doctoring, it's a little bit of mothering, it's a little bit of Mm -hmm. tutoring and, and mentoring, and you said it is like a relationship, so you do get to find out, unfortunately, things that are a little bit more than just, you are liable for this potential cancer. And yeah, and you know, as much as I would have liked to help this person, I cannot with my conscience. Was it bad what happened to him? Yeah, but you lost your cool buddies. A lot of recruiting, a lot of recruiting is so much gray area that it's insane. That is definitely a horror story. What do you what do you have as far as for a great experience? I was working for an agency, but my sister company, our sister company was also a coding bootcamp. And I loved working with the coding bootcamp and recruiting internally with them. I got to know the CEO, CEO. It was uh, wonderful. And when I found them, their product lead, it was a great thing because we had hosted this event. And I, when I'm going and networking, I'm there to network. So I'll talk to everybody and I'll you know have little conversations and do the matchmaking thing. And, you know, I started talking to this person about, they talked about functional programming. They're like, ask me about functional programming. I'm like, what is functional programming? And they started talking and I'm like, are you looking for a job? I'm a recruiter. I have to ask. And they're like, I could be. What are you talking about? So thankfully the CEO and the CEO were there that night. So I just introduced them to each other and he got hired. He's there now and he's doing well. So wonderful story about how me, an introvert, went out there to network and found the right person for them. Well, see, there you go. That's that matchmaking at its finest. It's like, listen, if I can't find you a partner, I'm going to find you a job. Exactly. Awesome. You know what? I think that pretty much wraps it up here. DJ, I appreciate you being on the podcast with us here. You can find her work on the frustratedrecruiter.com. Appreciate your time. Thanks, DJ. You too. Have your own recruiter or candidate story that you want to share with us? If you're listening on YouTube, comment below. If you're listening on your podcast app of choice, feel free to email us at go at miketech.tv. You can also find our full conversation unedited on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mike Tech Studios. That's M-I-K-T-E-K Studios. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, or your podcast app of choice. Thanks for checking out this episode. This is Michael Midnight signing off. Thanks again, guys. Bye now.